right, good afternoon. Welcome to the dark side of Ruby. And uh, since it's just before lunch, it's my job to build up your appetite. Well, I've uh, flown in from India, and uh, my company's name is George Software. We've been doing this for the past seven years, and it's been fun. But after seven years, you realize that, like in every marriage, the going is good in the start. Koichi san would vouch for that. Uh, but after a few years, you start to understand that there is another side to your spouse. So my aim here is not to ridicule or not to you know, uh, chastise Ruby, but to see the cure, the, the weirdness of Ruby. So that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. It's nothing scary. I still love Ruby. I still work in Ruby every day. But it's the weirdness that I want to point out. And if any one of you all get the aha moment, then we are in sync. Now, I've been seeing that uh, not many people are asking questions after the talks. So I said, let's reverse the tide. Most of my slides are actually questions for you all. So there's no brownie points for getting the answer right or wrong. But it's for you to understand. So I might ask you all, hey, what do you think? You know, raise your hands and try to be as interactive as you can. Now, uh, such a kind of talk is sometimes difficult because we, I don't know the, the, the audience come from a broad, broad spectrum, which is either beginners or some experts. But, you know, I realized the, the, the slides, well, the slide is the dark side of Ruby and it rhymed with the dark side of the moon. So I tagged my slides. And I have uh, my transformer friends to help me, Bumblebee, for all the sign of questions which are like a beginner level questions. And Optimus Prime for all kinds of little crazy stuff. So in case you need to tune out during these questions, that's okay. So without further ado, let's question. Let's talk about the infamous infinity. Now, everybody, let's try, I'm being easy, you can see Bumblebee there. It's all simple stuff first. Everyone knows the output of this? No points for that. We all know it's division by zero, but what about this? The hint is in the slide, guys. Ah, infinity. Well, all right, so let's see what is infinity, and infinity turns out to be. All right, so that's interesting. So, like, hmm. But then most of us already know that infinity is a constant defined in the float class. Well, all right, so I said, let's go find it. I actually went and dug into the code and found it. Infinity is defined like that in Ruby. But you know the interesting part here? It's defining missing.h. So that's pretty cool. So I had no idea infinity was actually missing. Well, these are the kind of things that I'm going to keep talking about. I'm going to ask a lot more questions. So I'm just warming you up into the game. The adrenaline rush. Anyone knows the output of this or what this really does? It's a number conversion to a string as an octal. So far, so good. No problems at all. What happens if I push the limit? That's still a number. So any one of you all next time sees uh, you know, names like asterisk, obelisk, get a fix, it could be a number. <laughs> well, let's push it, let's push it further. What happens now? Ah, that's an invalid radix. Now, that seems strange, but here's the trick. Radix 36 actually worked because I have 26 alphabets and 10 digits. So I can go up to 36. So if any one of y'all is lucky or smart enough to get a new alphabet introduced in the English language, dude, we're gonna have radix 37. Well, let's move on to our star of the show. 
the splat expander. We always use the star in lots of places, multiplication, but anyone knows the output of this? Sounds pretty simple, it looks like I've said it's a hash, so it should be a hash, which looks pretty straightforward. But uh, it gets a little more weird after this. What about this? Now I got, now it's pretty simple stuff, man. What are the, any, any takers for this one? What do you think, will it be three arrays of one, two, and three? Anyone? Will it be one array of one, 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 two, 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 and three, three, three? Or will it be one, two, three? Yeah, so I see some nodding heads, and that's pre perfectly fine, which see, makes logical sense, right? What about this? Hmm. The same array interspersed with percent? Well, string concatenation. So what you see is not always what you get. Uh, Let's do a little more stuff here, some more fun. This is a lambda. Uh, what if I call this? What is the output here? And this is straightforward Ruby stuff. Really, there's nothing weird in this. It's five? Yep, because you're looking at the first. I gave the hints there, middle, second, last, and last. And the output's pretty straightforward. But the interesting part here is in the call, we all know that we call a block like this, right? What happens if I do something like this, pay close attention to this part? Is that a syntax error? Anybody syntax error? That actually works, because that is a syntactic sugar for calling a block. And we'll see a little bit of it later. Now, speaking of syntax, this should be interesting. And now we'll actually see how many were really paying attention to Koichi san's talk in the morning? We're all used to seeing functions like this, right? Koichi san showed us this earlier in the morning. The keyword arguments introduced in Ruby 2.0. Use it because when you're looking at variables A and B, what look like parameters there can be actually accessed as local local variables inside the function foo. And then, special attention to this part. Have you written a syntax like this? Any takers that this is going to be a syntax error? But this is a mandatory keyword argument. It spoiled the show because of the morning talk. But this is a mandatory argument introduced in Ruby 2.1. Well, let's see some more syntax. Again, pretty simple stuff, straightforward method. Nothing fancier, right? How do I invoke this method? This works, right? Right? But when I try this, I get a syntax error. Now, why do I get a syntax error here? Did that look a little weird? No, I say, okay, let's do it again. And all I've done is close the gap. And this works perfectly fine. Why did this happen? It's Ruby. We say that you can call a method without passing the round parenthesis. So if I put a space there, the parser is actually going to interpret that as some sort of evaluation. And then if I had written that as one plus two, it would evaluate and pass three to method foo. But since it came across a comma, he says, dude, I have no idea what you're doing. So sometimes what you think works, should work, doesn't really work. Well, I've used the title syntax, but now is a simple question for you guys. And I'm pretty sure you'll be able to answer, what is A in this particular slide? Let me give you some multiple choice. How many think it's an array, A is an array? You can raise your hand, you're not wrong. Oh, come on, how many think it's an array? It is an array, right? But can it be something else? Can it be a hash? It can be a hash, right? Because in Ruby, keys can be anything. Can it be something else? 
course, it can be a string, but that is obvious, right? Something else? How about it being a proc? That actually works, because I can call a proc using the square bracket. Well, let's get to some sort of case complexities. All right, there pops up Optimus Prime. Time to take a break. <laughs> well, we look at, uh, we're all used to using case statements. Typically, we use it for simple stuff, checking that, you know, if, uh, if some value exists, if there's a number, if it's a string. But you know what? I can actually use and call a method here. This particular method effectively turns out to be evaluated like this. So I can actually have a method with the case equality, which is past the parameter in the case statement. So using this, I can use this case equality operator to actually evaluate something. But then what is it? The case equality operator is just an alias to the call method. So that's how we get the output. And this is the evaluated form of that case equality operator. Which in effect means that if I really want to change the way I want to compare two objects, all I have to do is override the method. And I can just do what I want. But speaking of the case equality operator, speaking of equality, mm, let's have some more fun. What is the output of this? Hmm. Don't think too much. If this was not true, would you even use this language? <laughs> it's true, all right, don't worry about it, it's true. What about this? Any takers? JavaScript people? <laughs> Somebody thought, ah, type check. Come on, guys, how can it be false? I just said it was a case equality operator, so it just compares the two. Uh, a common mistake made in Ruby because, typically because of a JavaScript bias, uh, we feel that it's a type equality check, you check the data type of the objects and stuff. No, oh, it's as simple as that, it's just a case equality operator, it's true. Well, what about this? EQL does seem like equal. It's true, but with some caveats. It's just an alias for the, the generic equality operator. However, however, it's overridden only for the numeric class. Most, most classes just alias it off to the generic equality operator. Well, what about this? It's got to be something different, right? When in doubt, choose either true or false. What's the output, people? Nil. Nil? <laughs> that was not binary, man. <laughs> but what else? It's got to give some output. This is, anyone for true? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Anyone for false? And the rest? No. Nah. This is actually an object identity check. So when you're using equal question mark, it's actually checking the object identity, which is why it's different. So what's the output here? Hey, people have been listening. And what's the output here? Ah, come on, we've not been listening. True or false? They're two different objects. True, false, well, in this case it's true. Ah, jeez, why? Because object IDs for fixed num are calculated like that. So if you have an object ID for a string, it gives you some big number, but object IDs for a fixed num are just multiplied by two plus one. Interesting, right? Now I urge you to go and ask a few of the core Ruby committers here, why is this so? Because this is pretty complex. Actually, not quite. Here's another snippet, which I was just pushing the limit to find out. On a 64-bit machine, if I do that 2 raised to 62 minus 1, it gives me a fixed num, but 2 raised to 62 gives big num, two different classes. Now, anyone 62? 
I'm sure it's nothing to do with a random number because it could have been, then it could have been 42, and it could have been the answer to life universe and everything. But we chose 62. It's a 64-bit machine. The last bit of fixed numbers actually determine whether that is going to be used as an object ID or not for other fixed numbers. So you have only 63 bits to play with. And that's why, that's how it works. Well, let's try and see if we have hit a jackpot today. So I wrote some code. And my code is simple, it's three pulls for a jackpot. Three pulls should tell me whether I have actually got a jackpot or I am the sucker. But I've written the code in a slightly different way with special mention about the curry method. Now, seems different, and here you can notice that I've actually called a block of code using square brackets. I'm calling the same method, but the evaluation is slightly different when I use the curry recipe. With curry, unless all the parameters, the block parameters are satisfied, it's not going to evaluate it, it's going to return you another proc. So it evaluates it twice, when all the third time the parameter actually comes in, it just evaluates the block. Well, there you have it, go and curry. And so, so you think you can tell, protect it from private. Somebody can. Okay. Well, what do you think of this? Here, will I save private Ryan? Traditional object-oriented methodologies tell us that private methods are not inherited, right? In Ruby, all methods are inherited. Private methods are indeed inherited. And uh, though this sounds very simple, though this sounds a little astounding to a few people here, my entire talk, my preparation of the talk started off with this point. Because let me take a simple poll. How many of you do not work in Rails, but work in Ruby? There'll be, a, I could count you on my fingers. The problem is all of us started working in Rails. And when you start working in Rails, it's so cool, it's so awesome that we tend to forget that it's also very important to learn Ruby. So when I started digging deeper with some of our developers, yes, we are a Ruby on Rails development company, and I started quizzing a few people, I realized that people did not know this. And I was, I was stumped, because if we do not know Ruby, then we cannot be good Rails programmers. But since Rails just makes it work, the Rails magic, people continue. Hence, the essence of my talk was to open your eyes to these things. Having said that, and we know that private methods are inherited, hmm, then what is the difference between protected and private anyway? We'll come to it. Before that, quick thought. We always use include, right, for any, including any module. But what is include? Is it a keyword? Is it a method? It's a method which is defined as a private method, private instance method in the class module. That's how you can actually use it there. Well, like I mentioned earlier, if all private methods are inherited, then what is protected in Ruby? Because again, traditionally, we've been taught that, oh, protected methods, oh, deals with inheritance. All protected methods are inherited in the subclasses, but you cannot call them on the object. Well, all private methods are also inherited. They cannot be called on the object. So what is the difference between the two? Ruby takes a very pragmatic approach. And protected works with objects and not classes. So you can invoke a protected method on an object if it's in the same lineage. And then you go, what the? Well, it's better with an example. So check this out. I actually have initialized Optimus Prime here. 
But can I call the protected method on it? I have an attribute accessor, Nick, there, for nickname, for brevity. Can I call the protected method on this object? It doesn't work. It's absolutely right. It doesn't work <laughs> because it's supposed. It's not supposed to work. You cannot directly call an object. Or you cannot call a protected method on an object. However, what happens if I change my code a little bit? I've actually defined a public method called fights. I've passed it another Autobot. Special attention again to this particular piece of code. Have I just called a protected method there? So it is possible to call the protected method on an object if both the objects come from the same hierarchy, the same lineage. So if two objects have the same parent class or the same class or their hierarchy, you can actually call them as long as you're within the class. Well, moving on. Hmm. Does Ruby have any keywords? Yeah, Ruby has keywords. So then I want you all to tell me whether I'm serious or I'm joking. Can I define a method called true? This code actually works. And it's not that I can define a method true, I can define a method called def. I can define a method called if. I can define a method by any freaking name that I want, whether it, we use it in standard Ruby or anything. But try defining a method with end, def end, and then you're going to have a little bit of what we call problems because I got to manage my tongue here. Oh boy, okay. So if you try and define any keyword as a method inside your class, it works, but again, it'll work only in your class. Try this on IRB and it won't work. Try this on IRB, it won't work. Put it inside a Ruby file, it works. Because IRB itself is a Ruby program. So you're evaluating this outside its scope. So put it inside a class, everything works fine. Well, who thought it was stacked too deep and went into a recursive loop? Well, it doesn't, but can it? Can I, how can I make this, can I make it go into stack too deep? If I had self.true inside my method false, if I had written self.true, and inside my method def true, I'd written self.false, it would actually go into a recursive loop and have a stack too deep error. All right, super. Up there we have it. We all know what super is, right? Super. If I try this, if I try out this code, so here I've written a class uh, in which I've defined a method called search, and in the child class I have defined another method called search, in which I take a mandatory keyword argument, and I call super. Should it work? I thought it should work, but it gives me an error which I couldn't quite follow in the start. Wrong number of arguments, one for zero. Now, it's actually given me an error exactly where super has been called, and it says wrong number of arguments, one for zero. I didn't pass any arguments there. So, should it have been zero for one? Because I didn't pass any arguments. Did I pass there? No, I didn't pass any arguments. But, if I change my code a little bit, again, notice, all I've added is the parenthesis there, and this code works fine. So if you really thought in Ruby that you'd never ever really need to use the round brackets and it's always optional, think again. Think again. Well, if this was good enough sauce for you right now, let's move on to modules and see how module mix-ins are sometimes pretty funny. Now this is a sample piece of code. Very, very, the sample is pretty simple. And, uh, Nothing fancy here, I've just defined three superheroes, the Superman, Batman, and Iron Man, all having the fly method in them, all right? This is how I invoke, or this is how I call a method already. I created a new guy, 
tiny man, right? I want him to get the superpowers of Superman, Batman, and Iron Man, and I want to make tiny man fly, and this just works fine. No questions so far. However, if I go and change my code in my modules, I do the unthinkable and add super in my module. What happens now? We know that modules are not classes. We know that modules cannot inherit from other modules. So if I call super in one of the methods, what happens? Lo and behold, this actually works. And now I was stumped. I was like, dude, there's something wrong here. How can this really work? So what happens here is when this class is instantiated, the meta class hierarchy that is built is actually done on the fly. So my inheritance hierarchy actually flows in this particular order. Which means that if I just change my module inheritance structure, I include, I change the inclusion order, I actually get a different inheritance hierarchy. And that is why super actually works. This is to be done with a pinch of salt. This we found out the hard way. Uh, we, found out, we found this out in actual production code because somebody made a mistake and somebody wanted to take a shortcut and had it super in one of the module methods and uh, shit hit the roof. And you're wondering, how the hell can this happen? Till we dug deep and found out, all right, there is more to Ruby than meets the eye. Well, if this wasn't enough, what about something like this? I want to cherry pick. You know, this is my module Megatron, who is powerful, but is evil. Now, in typical Indian style, I have my own class called Hanuman, okay? I want him to be as powerful as Megatron, but if I include him, Hanuman's going to be evil, and I am going to be killed. So I cannot let this happen. So can I cherry pick from the Megatron module? I want the power, but I don't want the evilness. Welcome to unbounded methods. So I can actually cherry pick from my module, find the method, it's an unbounded method, I bind it to my own object, and I can call it. And in this particular case, Hanuman is powerful, but he is not evil. And if this has not built your appetite, there are a lot of other things that happen in Ruby, but I have only half an hour for my talk, and I have a few minutes for questions. And if y'all aren't gonna ask me questions, I could probably ask you a few more. Well, that's all, folks.